Hi there, Dr. Kevin Winthrop, I'm back. Uh, some discussion about COVID today at the late breaker prompted me to uh, want to just finish this conference with COVID because we all have COVID on the brain. We're trying to keep it off our brain, uh, but it's uh, overwhelmed us in so many ways, of course. And uh, Jack wanted me to, to just answer a couple questions for you. First, I'll highlight the late breaker uh, poster by Dr. Serling Boyd from Boston. Uh, this was a cohort study uh, between uh, multiple healthcare centers. They found PCR positive cases and looked at rheumatic disease patients who were patient that were positive and compared them to control patients who were positive. Uh, 143 rheumatic disease patients and 688 uh, non-rheumatic disease patients, all with COVID. Um, and they looked at their outcomes. And what I think is the answer to the first question Jack wanted me to uh, address was uh, what they found. And what they found was the rheumatic disease patients seemed to be at about the same risk of being in the hospital as the non-rheumatic disease patients with COVID. And once in the hospital, their outcomes are largely the same. The, their death rate is largely uh, what we see in uh, the general population. Um, there's a few experiences, and in this one, the, the rate, the percent that ended up on mechanical ventilation was 15% versus 9% for the controls. But I've seen other data where, where those are more similar. And again, this is a pretty small study, uh, and that difference wasn't driven by too many um, numbers. Um, in terms of the percent in the ICU and the percent of death, it was equal between the groups. And I think that's the answer to the first question. Our rheumatoid arthritis patients uh, or other autoimmune disease patients at higher risk. And um, so my answer, Jack, is uh, I don't think they are, at least not what we've seen. If you look at the CDC overall hospitalization data for COVID, about 2.8% of patients in the hospital in the U.S. with COVID uh, have an underlying autoimmune disease, which is probably uh, not too far off from what the background population prevalence of autoimmune diseases. In fact, it's probably higher than that if you add in all sorts of things. Um, so, so I think to me, it appears that they're at uh, no higher risk of having it and no higher risk of being hospitalized should they have it uh, than the general population. Uh, so why is that? I think one reason, and I've seen survey data to support it, that, that I think these patients in general are more risk averse and they are uh, taking more precautions in terms of masking, uh, distancing and avoiding potential um, high risk situations. So that's one, one issue. Uh, and number two, uh, perhaps some of the drugs they're on are protective in some ways. So if they, if they do get it uh, and they end up in the hospital, uh, perhaps some of those drugs prevent prog progression or ameliorate uh, already progressed disease. And of course there are a number of RCTs we talked about the other day looking at the value of actually even using some of those drugs in the hospital therapeutically. But for people who end up having COVID who are already on those drugs, I'd say the observational studies so far, both in IBD, the secure IBD registry, as well as the Global Alliance for Rheumatology data so far suggest uh, that those drugs aren't really increasing the risk uh, of having a poor outcome. And if anything, there's some data from those two sources suggesting, again, it's observational, but suggesting maybe being on a TNF blocker is somehow protective from uh, a more advanced or worsened outcome. Uh, number two question, what DMARD or biologic drugs should be stopped? And I've been part of that ACR work group and we've published uh, some of our uh, musings and decisions uh, that are as database as they can be. Um, they're increasingly more database as more data is known. Uh, but uh, in general, we're, we're saying, hey, you know, if you get COVID, you should consider all these DMARDs similarly, you should stop them. Um, and you know, that would be how we advise around any serious infection. And given the potential for COVID becoming serious, should you have it, I think stopping those drugs uh, temporarily is, is very reasonable. Uh, prior to that, I don't think you need to stop them. Now, of course, if you're a contact to a case and you think you probably have it, uh, then, you know, again, you would stop it just as if you um, were, were a documented case. But, um, you know, again, this may change. It's a fluid situation. Uh, but for right now, I think that's pretty reasonable based on the data that, that we've seen. Um, what's the story with prednisone? Is it bad if people on prednisone get COVID? Uh, I just, I think, address that. 
I think the data, again, is observational data would suggest people who uh, are infected, who are on high dose steroids, seem to be more likely to have poor outcomes. Uh, of course, I don't know if that's the high dose steroids or if that's some other, or just a marker for, you know, worsened underlying disease or other factors that aren't being controlled for in those analyses. Uh, in the Global Rheumatology Alliance uh, cohort study initially, they, they did do a multivariate analysis. So they did try to control for, you know, differences in underlying disease and comorbidities. And they did see that still as association. So, uh, and I've seen that in other data as well, although not as well modeled, but I think it's probably um, a real association. In terms of dexamethasone, um, obviously this is a different story. We're, we're using this now as a standard of care in the hospital. If you look at that data though, it's really only supposed to be used starting at a certain point. In patients who are not receiving oxygen support or they're receiving quote unquote regular or low dose oxygen support, there's really no clear evidence that the dexamethasone helps you at that point. In fact, the, the discovery uh, data um, would or the recovery trial would suggest that uh, you know starting it earlier might even be detrimental. If you remember those survival curves, they they didn't look favorable in those early um, patients. So it was really the patients on high pressure oxygen and beyond those on you know uh, BiPAP and mechanical ventilation, ECMO, etc. That was where the mortality benefit was seen uh, and really being driven for in the dexamethasone data. So that's that's really where dex is um, indicated. Uh, number four, should my patients get the vaccine? What's the vaccine landscape? I, I, didn't, I didn't go into that because it's about a 45 minute talk. Um, you saw today, very exciting news from Pfizer. I mean, it was just a press release. There was no data as, uh, attached to it whatsoever other than saying an early look at our vaccine trial suggested 90% efficacy. Now that's way beyond my wildest dreams. I think most of us were thinking these vaccines are gonna come in the 50 to 60% range, might luck out, get a little higher, but 90% is really high. So whether that holds up with you know, further analyses and uh, when, when the study's done, uh, we'll see. I would be tickled uh, if it did, and that'd be fantastic. Now, of course, that's an mRNA, mRNA vaccine. Uh, it's gotta be kept really cold. So there's always these uh, storage and transportation issues around those types of vaccines. Um, so might complicate delivery, uh, et cetera, and you know, giving to a large population. But in that initial report, I think is really um, uh, hopeful. So I, I, I hope it holds up and I hope the other vaccines look, look that good too. Uh, should you get vaccinated? Uh, sure, yeah, you should when we have a vaccine <laughs> and when you can actually get it. Uh, it's gonna be a while, uh, but, but I definitely, uh, I, I Think it's unlikely we're going to see many safety concerns from these vaccines um, and like I said the, the efficacy may, may be better than than I was anticipating we'll have to see I suspect the efficacy will be different for different types of vaccines but but we're still months away from that number five drum roll please how long will the pandemic continue um, I might have said this the other day but I, I think it's gonna just keep going for a long time I mean I, I think this virus has become endemic I think we're going to probably see a seasonality to it, and uh, it'll be several years before we get enough people in the world um, with uh, immunity, either naturally or by vaccination. Uh, we also really still don't know how long immunity lasts. I mean, we do know people are getting reinfected after three months. Uh, so for some people, obviously, immunity doesn't last that long. Uh, and in some of those cases, they've had worse infections the second time around, which is counterintuitive. So, um, so I, we don't know. And I'm gonna answer this question again for you in like three months when we have a lot more data. Uh, but, but for right now, I, I think we should just prepare to uh, do things that Dr. Fauci uh, told us all to do uh, during his uh, ACR talk, wear a mask, stay, stay distant uh, or somewhat separated. Uh, live our life as, as, uh, to the fullest as we can, but uh, you know, avoid large gatherings and do the right thing in terms of uh, washing our hands and infection control. So uh, for now, that's our best uh, preventive uh, effort. And um, unfortunately, we weren't all able to get together at ACR, but maybe next year we will be. Uh, we'll just all be wearing masks. I, I don't know. And I think wine should be involved too, because I definitely... I, I'm optimistic about that. Uh, anyway, I hope you guys had a great conference. I did. I actually really enjoyed cruising around the website uh, when I could find stuff uh, to look at it. 
uh, and I thought some of the sessions went really well. So thanks very much and uh, have a great holiday season, everyone. Cheers. Thank you.